Hello Visilingus and welcome back to my channel and today I'm very excited to present to you a guest who I very much look up to. He is an amazing polyglot linguist and just an overall great man. <laughs> well. So Steve Kaufman, would you like to <laughs> would you like to introduce yourself? Well, uh, that's a very nice introduction. I'm very happy to accept that very flattering introduction, but I'm none of those things. <laughs> uh, I am Steve Kaufman. I love languages. Uh, most of my professional career was actually in the, in the forest industry. Uh, although for the first seven years I was a Canadian diplomat and then I worked in the forest industry. And uh, just the last uh, 15 years or so, I got very interested in, in language learning, uh, the whole sort of internet language learning community. Uh, together with my son, we created a, a platform for language learning. And uh, basically since the age of 60, I have learned more languages than I did prior to the age of 60. Mm. Uh, and so it's, it's, a bit of, it's become a bit of a passion mm. here in my, uh, in my old age. Well, that's fascinating. So, okay, I need to ask, the platform. Yeah. I have used your platform, I think, for years now. How do you pronounce it? Because some people say link, some people say link you. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we struggle with that because we began by calling it Link because we felt, uh, I don't know for what reason, you know, uh, just my son and I, Link, you know, you, we say link words and link, linking words to sound, linking words to meaning, creating networks, links of neurons in the brain. But then more and more people started saying Link Q because it's yeah. L-I-N-G-Q. <laughs> so we're exactly. comfortable. People can call it whatever they want. We, pers we amongst ourselves, we call it Link. But a lot of people in different languages, I was recently in Spain, wherever, people do call it Link Q. So that's fine. Okay. Yeah, because I, for the most part, used to call it Link Q until recently when the majority of people who used it around me said Link and I thought, oh, have I, mm. have I been missing something? But so what inspired you? I mean, obviously you have this passion for languages, which is amazing. But what inspired you to create the platform Link in the, I guess, in the set, the way that it's set up and what was your overall vision with the platform? Okay, first of all, we didn't have an overall vision. Mm -hmm. And uh, what <laughs> the, the sort of the, the trigger is very strange. I was learning Cantonese. So I discovered the mini disc player, all right? The mini disc player, which preceded the MP3 player, to me was a revolution. Because I remember, you know, audio cassettes, I remember open real tape recorders. So all of a sudden you have this mini disc player. So I said, okay, I'm gonna learn Cantonese. So I got a bunch of stuff recorded for me and I had these you know, little discs on my mini disc player. And, and, and I used to also record the radio in Cantonese. And I heard about a Chinese immigrant who arrived in Vancouver at the airport, had all his savings in a bag, and the money, $10,000, was stolen at the airport. Apparently there are gangs that prey on these immigrants because they know the Chinese immigrants arrive with all their savings in a little bag. So he looks mm -hmm. away, his bag is gone. I was listening to Cantonese radio there. One of the, they were talking about, you know, this incident. So uh, at that time in our company, we were creating software for the sawmill industry. By the way, we sold some software to uh, at least two sawmills in Latvia, by the way. Mm -hmm. At any rate, so we had the, uh, you know, the software section. So I said to myself, well, we'll give this guy a job. Either he's good, in which case we keep him and he's good. Or if it doesn't work out, then at least we help him out for a couple of months. And so we had him kept him for eight months. He had a lot of trouble communicating in English, although it had, he had a high score in TOEFL. And so we developed this program to help him improve his English and to give him a sense of what Canadians think and do and how we do business. Because he had, you know, a TOEFL, but he didn't understand how people thought. And so we had interviews with people, business people, all kinds of people, get, try to get him into a, you know, English speaking sort of mindset and accumulate words and phrases. So the, basically the, the beginnings of Link. Uh, but in the end, he went back to China. He didn't fit in. Uh, but then we had this thing. So we tried, uh, we approached the Canadian government immigration service and we said, look, you have a lot of so-called skilled immigrants who come in. We're not talking about illiterate, you know, farmer ladies. We're talking about skilled immigrants who, who are literate in their own language, who could use this system. But of course the government is very bureaucratic and uh, all of the sort of groups that help immigrants are more motivated to get more funding from the government than to actually help yeah. the immigrants. Yeah. So we got nowhere with those people because they couldn't see how that would bring 
more people into their classrooms so they can get more funding from the government. So then we said, okay, that's not going to work. So then we will make it a multi-language platform. And so that's the beginning of Link. And uh, we struggled with it. We made every possible mistake. We, we did everything wrong. And we had the servers going down just as we were promoting it. We just, I don't even want to go through all of the pain <laughs> that yeah. we went through. Yeah. And anyone in his right mind would have given up, but I was determined to stay with it. And so together with my son, Mark, we stayed with it. But really it was this immigrant, the, the origin of, of Link, without this story, without me learning Cantonese and finding out about this immigrant who had all his money stolen at the airport, there would be no Link. Mm. But at no time was it a plan, a vision, <laughs> uh, <Yeah. laughs> none of that, month yeah. to month. But I think I think that's that's where actually the most amazing success stories start, or even the best concepts. They literally, you know, are discovered or created out of just sheer luck sometimes, or just mm -hmm, mm -hmm. happenstance. And I think that's amazing. Um, okay, so I think something that I'm really curious about is, and it's not to do with language actually, but it, it ties into languages. Um, so you mentioned that you worked, or a lot of your career was as a diplomat and then as an entrepreneur. Um, right. How would you say that your, I guess, how did your love for languages develop from this? Did it develop afterwards? And I guess, what would you say have been the key, oh. I guess, like learning, or like key learnings from these experiences in your life? Well, um, I think that one of the big triggers was when I went to university, I had a professor of French literature who made French interesting because all the time we had French at school, it was not interesting. And so we were not motivated to learn it, even though in Montreal, you know, two thirds of the city was French speaking, one third is English speaking. Uh, in those days, the city was kind of divided. There was a, one million English speakers, two million French speakers, uh, in any kind of a work situation, office, whatever, everyone spoke English. So there wasn't much motivation to learn French. That has changed now, but that was the situation in the 50s. Uh, but I went to university, had this very stimulating professor. He turned me on to French civilization, French culture, Molière, La Nouvelle Vague, whatever was going on in those days. And as a result, I went off to France and I studied there for three years. I got my university degree from France. Uh, and then I joined the federal government and I heard that they were planning to send someone to China to learn to somewhere to learn Chinese. And so I started learning Chinese on my own because I said, that's something I'd like to do. So the confidence that I could become a fluent speaker of French made me think I could do the same thing in Chinese. So I think that's a very important point. A lot of people learn languages and they don't think they're ever going to become fluent. And once you've done it once, you know, you can do it, then you're you know, you want to, exactly. you know, you, anything yeah. you know you can do, you want to try and do it again. Uh, so then I was sent to Hong Kong to learn Chinese. I did that. Thereafter, I lived in Japan. So I started accumulating languages. I knew it was something I could do. So yeah, I continued. I mean, German, I, I had heard German. Uh, I worked on a German boat. Uh, I worked a bit in Vienna. Uh, also, when I was very young, my, my parents are actually from what, what was the Austro-Hungarian Empire, became Czechoslovakia and they spoke both Czech and German. So I heard those languages at home, but they always spoke English with us. And so then I decided to learn German. So I scoured the bookstores of Vancouver to find secondhand books <laughs> with, with uh, you know, vocabulary and blah, blah, blah. So, so throughout that part of my career, and I needed the Japanese for my business, I needed Swedish for my business, mm -hmm. uh, German, Spanish, and then, but since the age of 60, then I've had this tremendous investment of time, starting with Russian, well, starting with Cantonese, then Russian, then Korean, Portuguese. These are the languages that I have learned essentially over the last 15 years. So would you mind if I switched up the language that I ask you a question in? Not Excellent. at all, no. Okay, sure. also, wie, wie gut ist dein Deutsch? <laughs> Nicht sehr gut, Nicht sehr gut. weil ich habe sehr wenig uh, Gelegenheit, Deutsch zu, zu sprechen. Und ich lese keine Deutsch jetzt, weil ich versuche immer äh, neue Sprachen zu lernen. Yeah. Aber wenn ich werde zum Beispiel einige äh, Wochen in, in, in Deutschland äh, bleiben, dann ich glaube, wird mein Deutsch zurückkommen. Aber ich kann sowieso, ich verstehe, ich kann also yeah. mit, mit sehr viel Fehler kann ich äh, sowieso. Alles gut. 
Gut, okay, dann stelle ich dir eine Frage äh, auf Deutsch. Und zwar, also was würdest du sagen, sind die besten Lernmethoden, die du entdeckt hast? Also ich habe äh, keine äh, Methoden äh, entdeckt, aber... Also für, äh, für dich mich, entdeckt. Für mich, also für mich ist es ist äh, immer Lesen und, und Hören. Und mal, also wenn ich fange an, dann muss ich sehr wiederholen, sehr viele einfache Geschichten wiederholen äh, und immer äh, die beide, das heißt Audio und Text. Man muss hören und lesen, dieselbe Dinge, äh, selbe, selbe, selbe äh, Inhalt, Einhalt. Ich, im, Inhalt manchmal, ja. manchmal, ja, ja, <lacht> zwischen Schwedisch und Deutsch ist ein bisschen. Ja. Aber ja. man muss sehr viel hören, sehr viel lesen. Aber dann, wenn eine, eine, man hat eine Base, dann ich versuche immer, ähm, also interessante äh, Inhalte zu, zu, zu lesen und zu hören. Das ist, ich habe, das ist meine Strategie. Einfache Dinge, sehr viel mal wiederholen und dann immer neue, interessante Dinge zu entdecken. Mhm. Immer lesen und hören. Und dann äh, eventuell sprechen. Ja. Ähm, wenn man, also, wenn man äh, gut sprechen will, dann muss man sehr viel sprechen. <lacht> klar, Aber wenn man klar. hat keine Wörter, ja. wenn man versteht nichts, dann kann man nicht sprechen. Ich will nicht immer, äh, wie heißt du, äh, ja. wie geht es Ihnen, okay? Ich will äh, etwas über, ja, ich weiß nicht, äh, Politik oder äh, interessante Dinge sprechen. Und deswegen muss ich eine ganze, ganz große Wortschatz haben. Wortschatz haben. Ja, also ich finde für mich zum Beispiel, also ich bin ganz deiner Meinung, wenn ich eine Sprache anfange zu lernen, dann ähm, für mich ist es auf jeden Fall sehr wichtig, am Anfang sehr viel zu hören. Also ich höre mir Gespräche mhm. an, ich höre mir Musik an, alles Mögliche. Klar, dann schreibe ich auch ein paar Notizen. Also mhm. ich will ja auch natürlich die Phrasen lernen. Aber ich finde, mhm. ja... Ich, ich will immer das lernen, was für mich und mein Leben relevant ist. Und dann quasi so, ich nenne das meine Copy-Paste-Taktik, ähm, wo ich quasi das mhm. aus den Gesprächen, welche ich mir angehört habe, rausnehme und dann in meinen Alltag dann wieder so einfüge. Mhm. Mhm. Interessant, interessant. Interessant. Also, es ist ein bisschen schwer. Ich, ich habe nicht so viel Gelegenheit, diese Sprache zu, zu verbrauchen. Zum Beispiel, ich, ich wohne in Vancouver, ich lerne... Ja. Arabisch, Türkisch, also Iranisch, Persisch vielleicht gibt es äh, Emigranten aus Iran. Aber äh, sonst ist, habe ich nicht so viel Gelegenheit. Deswegen für mich ist es äh, hauptsächlich sehr viel hören und lesen. Mhm. Sehr gut. Uh, alors, est-ce que je peux äh, demander quelque chose en français? Ja, <lacht> sicher. Avec plaisir. Alors, ähm... Il y a, il, bon, il existe euh, la question de l'essence. Et comment définirais-tu l'essence dans une langue Bon, c'est-à-dire euh, l'essentiel, c'est-à-dire là, euh, on va se tutoyer, ok On va se tutoyer. Mm -hmm. Tu veux dire quel est euh, l'essentiel, enfin l'esprit le, le, d'une langue Ou, et quelles sont les choses qu'il faut apprendre Je n'ai pas trop bien compris ce que tu entends par le mot essence. Pour moi, l'essence, euh, comme fluency. Oui, bon, c'est-à-dire, euh, fluency, euh, c'est-à-dire de parler couramment. Hein? C est, c est, oui, 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 de parler couramment. Oui, mais ben, pour moi, bon, euh, bien sûr, le but, c'est de pouvoir, de mon avis, le but, c'est de pouvoir parler cou couramment. Le but. Mais mm -hmm. parler couramment, ça ne veut pas dire parler sans faute. Ça ne veut pas dire oui. parler oui. comme un, un, comment dit un natif. Euh, couramment, c'est de pouvoir s'exprimer sur beaucoup de choses, beaucoup de sujets. Oui, c'est ça. De bien comprendre, ça. mais avec, avec des fautes. Et c'est mon but, oui. euh, mais ça prend du temps. Ça prend beaucoup de temps. Euh, et pour moi, ça passe par la compréhension. Si je ne comprends pas très bien, Jamais je n'arriverai à un niveau de, 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 de fluence, il n'existe pas en français, de mon avis. Enfin, je ne connais pas le mot, mais enfin, de pouvoir parler couramment, il faut bien comprendre. Donc, ça passe par la compréhension et ça ne veut pas dire qu'il n'y aura pas des choses très banales 
que t- où tu vas te faire des fautes, où tu vas oublier, où tu ne sais pas, tu ne connais pas. Il y aura toujours des, oui, oui. des lacunes dans ta connaissance. Mais dans la, dans la langue maternelle, euh, c'est la même chose parce qu'il y a beaucoup de gens qui parlent, pour exemple, l'anglais. Et l'anglais, c'est la langue maternelle. Mais il y a beaucoup de fois oui. aussi. Parce que moi, moi-même, je, j'oublie parfois quelques mots en anglais. Même que c'est ma, ma langue maternelle. Tu sais. <rire> non, mais y a, la différence, c'est que y a, dans les langues euh, que tu as apprises, Mm-hmm. Euh, il y a toujours des choses très banales comme euh, oui. se brosser les dents ou euh, n'importe quoi des, des concepts très très simples où oui. tu n'as pas encore eu l'occasion tu n'as pas été dans cette situation donc tu ne connais pas les mots et, et les expressions nécessaires alors que pour mm-hmm. le natif qui a vécu dans la langue depuis <rire> sa naissance il n'y oui. a pas, cette situation n'existe pas Peut-être sur des sujets très difficiles, il va manquer des mots. Mais pour les, pour les choses de, de tous les jours, le natif a tous ses mots et ses expressions. Mais pour nous qui apprenons les langues étrangères, il peut y avoir des situations très banales où nous, nous n'avons mm-hmm. pas les mots. Oui, c'est vrai, c'est vrai. Voilà. Um, and to finish off, actually, I didn't even ask you, I guess, the most important question. What are the languages that you speak and which ones are you, are you most I would say passionate about. I know you. It's a, it's a hard question. It's the one that everybody always asks. But I think it would be interesting for my viewers to know. Well, I I, I am passionate. I like them all for different for different reasons. Mm-hmm. So it, you know, in declining order of proficiency, I mean, so I mean English. I speak obviously the best, <laughs> followed by French, <laughs> Japanese, Mandarin, Spanish, Swedish, maybe German, Italian. Russian, Cantonese, what are you, Portuguese, um, I can't remember why. Ukrainian, it's not bad. When I was in Ukraine, I was on television in Ukrainian. Uh, but then it oh. starts to fall off a bit. Well, I was on, I was inter- I was on primetime television in both Russian and Ukrainian. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I put it up on my YouTube channel. But then Korean, uh, when I speak to Koreans, they think I speak well, but in fact, I don't. I know that I'm lacking in comprehension. I'm lacking in vocabulary. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's languages that I learned and the same with like Czech I did for a long time then I went to Czech Republic I was speaking quite well but I haven't spoken in a long time so I'd struggle mm-hmm. Polish I, I put six months into Polish and of course the Slavic languages are I mean there's a lot of similarity mm-hmm. you know 60 60% vocabulary and the grammar is essentially yeah. you know largely the same uh, but I haven't used those languages so I would struggle to speak in them right now And I would struggle even more in, say, Romanian and Greek, which I, I learned during a concentrated period of time because I was going to visit the country. And when I was in the country, I was speaking, but now I would very much struggle. But if, if I put in uh, even a little bit of effort, and I would probably go to our many stories at length, um, I think very quickly I'd be back where I was before, and very quickly I'd be better than I was before. Uh, and then I come to the last three, the ones that I'm working on right now, which is Arabic, Persian, and Turkish. I put out on my channel a sort of an exit video after three months of studying each of those languages so people can judge for themselves, but I have a long, long, long way to go. Long way to go. <laughs> And especially doing them three at a time, three of them every day, I'm going to be a couple of years doing that, but I think, you know, I, I'm confident that the more time I put in, the better I get. So if I put in enough time, I will eventually get to where I want mm-hmm. to get to. So- Just to finish off our wonderful interview, what would you say then to, what would be your like one piece of of motivation, I guess, for people who are at that point where they, they feel like they're struggling, where they want to give up or they're just really frustrated. What helps you kind of get out of those phases where you feel like you're not really making much progress, but you're still motivated to learn the language? Um, you know, a few things I would say. First of all, you have to stay with it. Uh, you can take a little time off, but you have to stay with it. Uh, even if you take some time off, my experience is the language will continue to gestate in your brain, so you won't lose it. It might be a bit rusty when you get back to it, but you'll very soon be better than you ever were. Uh, but you have to, you know, so you can take a week off, but you have to stay with it. Uh, so you have to be confident that what you are doing, the time you're putting in, is worth it. Second of all is vary your activities. 
If you're listening and reading, then do something else. Write, do flashcarding, listen to music, vary the content, vary between difficult material and easy material. Try and keep it interesting for yourself. Uh, so that would be the second thing. And uh, try to enjoy it. That goes mm -hmm. with staying with the process. If you enjoy it, you're likely yeah. to stay with the process. If you stay with the process, you will succeed. You just have to believe that. However frustrating it seems at times because you were in a conversation, you didn't understand, you mm. couldn't find your words. Doesn't matter, just keep going, you will, you will improve. The brain, as, as Manfred Spitzer, the German neuroscientist says, the brain cannot do otherwise than learn, but the brain yes. learns slowly. Yes, very true, exactly. And I think particularly those moments where you, you know, you have messed up or you've made mistakes and you you feel frustrated are actually the biggest um, catalysts for improvement and growth in my opinion anyway because I feel like because you are so yes that they're, they're, they're bad they suck in the in those moments but you almost you have this then deeper sense of okay I want to get past this what can I do to get past this and because our brains are you know problem we're problem solvers by nature we will go and seek out different ways in order to overcome that that hurdle and that challenge mm -hmm. so yeah Absolutely. thank you very much steve for coming onto my channel all right. i enjoyed thank it you. thank you very and much <laughs> Not at all i enjoyed it and good luck to you in, in all of your endeavors thank you likewise likewise so guys uh thank you very much for watching this interview and i will leave all of steve's links below in the description box und bis zum nächsten mal